Thank you. Good morning. I feel so welcome here. I got my own parking space. That's very nice. <laughs> some places don't have don't give me that, you know. You like some associations. You know Berkeley has six parking spaces? Six for the whole association. Oakland has about twenty, so I'm very happy here. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Um, yes, I'm here to update you on the latest, and this is the perfect time of the year to do it because two things just happened. The governor signed all the bills, and the forms are about to come out. I know what you're thinking. You've got enough laws and enough forms. Do you need any more? Too bad. You're going to get them anyway. <laughs> so uh, that's just the way it is. So I'm going to talk about, like I said, the new laws, the new forms. Some cases, too. The really interesting lawsuits have happened recently and may be happening. Um, you know, I think the most interesting case of the year, did you hear about this case where there are these two realtors down in Los Angeles working together, happen to be at a Keller Williams office, and they're working sort of as partners. You know, you ever have realtors work together, it's sort of informal partners, so any deal that comes along, they share it, and they split the commission, right? So they're working together, and then one of the realtors leaves Keller Williams and goes to another company, Beverly Hills. When he's at the new company, gets a buyer, good buyer. Buyer buys a $15 million house. He ends up getting a commission on this sale of 210000 I mean, you can live a couple months on that, right? I mean, that's pretty good. But then all of a sudden he gets a phone call from his friend back at Keller Williams says, where's my half? He says, have you noticed we don't work together? I mean, you're at Keller Williams, I'm at this new company. And the other guy says, so? We had a deal to work together. Who said it? We had to be at the same office to work together. You owe me $105,000. New agent says, hey, drop dead. Anyway, blah, blah. So he sued him for $105,000. Trial court says, dismiss the case, says, number one, you don't work together anymore. Number two, real agents can't sue agents anyway. Aha, uh -huh. the court of appeal reversed. The court of appeal said, number one, agents can't. If agents agree with other agents to share commissions, those agreements are enforceable agent to agent, even if they're not in writing. And you don't even have to be working at the same company. What's the moral of the story? Be careful like when you're drunk one night and you're with one of your, <coughs> one of your fellow realtors and you just say, hey, you know, we, I think we could work well together. Let's do some deals together, you know? You don't know what you've just committed yourself to. Right? So this is crazy. I mean, it's crazy on two levels. The first time we've ever had a case where a salesperson was, was actually successfully able to, able to sue another salesperson. Didn't have to go through the broker. It was just sales. You owed me money. And the second thing is they didn't even have to work together for this to be enforceable. Like I said, be careful what you agree to. Question. How long would that last? Until it was terminated. Until, Until you terminated if it's well, terminated. Right. Isn't that interesting? Well, you can terminate a, ver a verbal agreement in writing, right? Wow. Which is what they should have done. Isn't that crazy? Actually, to tell you the truth, this agreement was in writing. I mean, their original agreement was in writing, but the point is it didn't have to be. A verbal agreement between agents to share commissions could be enforceable. So, like I said, when you're drunk, be careful what you say. Actually, when you're drunk, you can probably get out of it because when you're... If you enter into a contract with lack of capacity, you can usually get out of it. So that was probably a bad example. But you know what I'm saying, right? All right. Anyway, I'll go back. That's an interesting case, don't you think? All right. Let's talk about the new laws that were signed last month. Does anyone know how many laws the governor signed? About 808. How many of them had anything to do with real estate or your life? 41. If you want to see all 41, we have a handout on the website, 2016 New Laws. But let me just give you like the top 10, okay? Um, but we have it on the website, the New Laws. By the way, what I'm saying today, everything I'm saying today will be in the risk management report that will be posted on the website probably by the end of the week or early next week, okay? My summary of the new laws, the new forms, and the cases It'll be there. Anyway, so let's talk about the new laws. Interesting new laws that just got passed. You know what I think the most interesting new law is? It, it created a new form of deed. You know what a grant deed, quit claim deed, trustees deed? Well, there's a new deed. You know what it's called? Transfer on death deed. It creates a new way to transfer real estate upon death. Right now, if you want to convey your property to someone else upon your death, you have four choices. 
put them in your will, put them in your trust, uh, make them a joint tenant with you, or God forbid, actually marry the person. That, that's the fourth way to do it, you know. <laughs> that's an extreme example right there, you know. I don't want to go that far. But anyway, those are your four ways in community property. There's now a fifth way. You sign a deed, TOD, transfer on death deed. You put the name of the beneficiary there. You die, they get it, period. No trust, no probate, no marriage. They, it's automatic. It's, uh, it's only limited to residential one to four, but I think it's really designed for people who don't have a complicated estate. They really got one asset. They got one house. They want to give the house to their kid or whatever. So there's now a very simple way to do it. It's called TOD, transfer on death deed. The law takes effect January 1st. I mean, you could, these deeds are available now. You could sign one now, but then you have to make it to the end of the year. Okay, you got you to... <laughs> You got to live that long if you want it to be effective. Notarized, right. right. Notarized, recorded. It's got to be recorded within 60 days after you sign it. Now, what if you change your mind? You can change your mind. It's not an irrevocable deed. It's a revocable deed. In fact, you could change your mind up until the time you expire, right? As long as you, as long as you do that. In fact, if you sell the pro if you give someone a transfer on death deed and then you sell it, that automatically revokes it. Or if you put it into a trust, that automatically revokes it. Or you get married with joint tenancy or community property with right of survivorship, that automatically revokes it. Interestingly, putting them in a will does not automatically revoke it. Interesting. Um, what, if, what if you have a property that's, that's underwater and you really want to get rid of it and it's got like 12 types of environmental problems? So I'm going to really give it to this person stick them with this. Well, obviously, they don't have to accept it, right? You understand? You can't force someone to take your property, but um, they have to want it. They have to actually, you know, record the affidavit of death and, and, and the transfer of ownership. But it, it's a pretty simple process. Um, you have to put the name, the specific, you can't say, I'm, I'm giving this home to my children. You have to specify the names. You have to you can only do one of these. You can't give one of these to one person and one of these to another person. Each give them half. You have to give your entire interest in the property with one transfer on death deed. But you can name more than one beneficiary on the transfer on death deed. If you name like two, they automatically take equal shares as tenants in common. Okay? So it's pretty interesting. It's a, it's a, I don't know if title companies may automatically offer this when you close escrow. Hey, you want to give it to someone? You know, I mean, it's, it, it's a pretty simple process. It takes effect January 1st. Any questions on just that? Or if they come to you later? Yeah. You get a stepped up basis, you know, and it, it does trigger property tax reassessment. You know, it's pretty like pretty much like most other transfers. Okay, so that's the thing is, that's not directly related to you, but but it's interesting. All right, now let me talk about a couple laws that specifically affect realtors. One of them is if you're a broker and you have a trust account and you have a you want to designate one of your employees to have access to the trust account. They have to get a, a fidelity bond. It used to be they had to get a non-deductible fidelity bond. Turns out those aren't really available. So now it's okay to they can get a five per, up to, a deductible with a, a bond with at least a deductible up to five percent. You can have an employee have access to your trust account if that's what you want to do. No big deal. Second thing, continuing education. Starting next year, all brokers in the room. Next time you renew your license, you have to take a three-hour class in management and supervision. What if you're a broker associate, you don't manage anybody? You still have to take the class. One time for renewal, three hours. What if you're an agent? Can you take this class? Sure, you can if you want to. You want to learn how to be supervised? Sure. But you don't have to, right? Brokers have to take this class starting next year, okay? One more law that affects you, which is it. This is important. Um, deals with teams. Remember how I was mentioned a second ago about that case with the two realtors working together as partners? Sometimes people do that, but sometimes realtors actually are a team, right? A formal team. Let's say, for example, I was an agent and I worked for, let's say, Cobalt Banker. And I wanted to take a listing, so I put on the for sale sign listed by Gov Hutchinson at Cobalt Banker. Can my name be bigger than Cobalt Bankers? The law says, yeah, the law has no restriction on it. 
I mean, my broker, Cobalt Banker, could tell me, well, if you want to work here, your, our name has to be bigger than your name. But there's no law that says my name and their name has to be a particular size. Do I have to put their name at all? Yeah. yeah. But that's not a law. That's just a code of ethics. Code of, the law doesn't even require you to put their name there. F, you're all realtors. You're all code of ethics. So you have to, you have to put your, their name there. But it doesn't have to even be a particular size. OK. But what if instead of being just an agent, Gov Hutchinson, I, was, I had a team of agents. And we call ourselves the Hutchinson team, right? So I want to put on a for sale sign. This is listed by the Hutchinson team at Cobalt Banker. Well, guess what the law says now? Number one, on the sign needs to go my BRE number and the broker's BRE license number. See, a normal sign, you don't have to put any BRE license numbers. But if a team is marketing, two BRE numbers have to appear on those marketing materials, the brokerage one and one of the members of the team. And the rule also says, by law, the name of the team can't be any bigger than the name of the brokerage. So there's two restrictions, two BRE numbers and relative size. Now, there are a million signs out there that violate this. The question is, how many people is the BRE going to hire to look at signs? And they said, well, there's going to be a grace period where you can fix your signs. So I say to the BRE, how long is the grace period? They said, we're not telling. So <laughs> one of these days, the grace period is going to be over, and they're supposedly going to be going after Realtors who violate this new sign uh, restriction on marketing by teams. Yes. The Mickey Mouse team. In other words, doesn't have the name of the realtor. That's a very interesting question. Related to this. Okay, in the past, in the past, if you wanted to market with a team name, you had to get a fictitious business name. Your broker had to go get a DBA for that team name. So the new rule says, well, you do have to do this marketing, but you don't have to get a DBA anymore if the name of the team includes the word group, team, or associates. So if you call yourself the Hutchinson team, the Hutchinson group, the Hutchinson associates, these rules kick in, but you don't have to get a DBA. But like he says, what if you want to call yourself the Mickey Mouse team? Well, that you still need a DBA for. Okay. Now, will the BRE still approve those types of names? I'm trying to get an answer out of them for that one. Um, probably they would. But I will tell you this. They will not allow you to use your name in a team name if you don't use the word team, group, or associates. So let's say I wanted to call, I live in Culver City, I want to call myself you know, the Hutchinson team of Culver, I mean, the, 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 the Hutchinson superstars, the, the, you know, I mean, something like that, not using the word team, group, or associates. You can't do that anymore. So if you're going to include the last name of a member of the team, the only way to do it is group, associates, or team, and then these rules kick in. But he has a different question. What if you want to call yourself a team that does not include the last name of one of the people on the team? Then that's just an old DBA. Then you still got to get a DBA for that. And I don't see why they wouldn't allow a DBA for that. Okay? Everyone? Okay, yeah. A size of what? I mean, how big does the license number have to be? It doesn't say. Readable, legible, prominent. I mean, but the broker's name and the there's no requirement on how big they have to be as long as the the team name can't be bigger than the broker's name. You know what I mean? Now everything I say on this, remember the broker's in charge. The broker can say I don't care what the rules are. My company, our rule is my name is twice as big as your name. You know what I mean? I mean, broker can still set their own rules, but this is like a minimum standard. The BRE says, I don't care what your broker says. By law, the two names have to be equally sized, and I want those BRE numbers there. Yeah. Does the license number apply if the sign is the company sign and the team name is a rider sign? 
I think so. Even if the team name is a rider, there's still that's still a marketing piece with a team name. So I still think you have to put both BRE numbers on that sign. Yes. What if your team name is uh, totally different, like Bakersfield Properties? So right. You're not your own broker, you're working under someone else. Right. So in other words, it's a team name, you're working under someone else, but the team name doesn't have the name of a of one of the agents. That's a DBA. So the broker would still get a DBA for that. Brokers can get as many DBAs as you want, okay? But there's a special rule with a particular type of name. Now related to this, let's say you are an agent and you have your own you have a you work under a DBA. There's another new law that says you the agent, the salesperson can own the DBA. Up until now the broker had to get the DBA and the agent belong to the broker, so if the agent changed companies, they couldn't take their DBA with them. There's now a law that says, with the broker's permission, you can take the DBA with you from company to company if you want. The broker has to allow you to do that in the first place, but once they do, it's yours, and you have the right to take it with you. Yes. Right. You're not talking about teams. You're just talking about DBA, right. 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 No. There's no restrictions on that. Unless, I'm glad you asked that, if it's a salesperson owned DBA, then the broker's name does have to be as big as the salesperson owned DBA. If the broker owns the DBA, there's no, there's no requirement to put BRE license numbers, and there's no requirement on relative size. I hope I said that. If there's a salesperson-owned DBA, you also need the two BRE license numbers. So maybe to, a better way to summarize this, there are now two situations where you have to worry about uh, relative size and BRE numbers. Number one, marketing by a team. Number two, marketing with a salesperson-owned DBA. In both of those situations, you need two BRE numbers and you have to worry about the relative size of the two names. I'm not gonna, I'm not, gonna not memorizing all this. We do have a nice Q&A that explains all this and, and it's on this handout too. It's, very, it's complicated stuff, okay? All right, that's the latest from the BRE. So we talked about the transfer on death data, talked about the BRE stuff. What else is new? What's the next category? Do I have any landlords in the room? Property managers, own rental property. Do you want to know the latest? Okay. I have good news and bad news. Let's start with the good news. You know, tenants like to sue landlords for mold issues. What will happen is all of a sudden you get sued by the tenant says, there's toxic mold on the property. All my kids are sick. You owe me $100,000. You'll be happy to know they can't do that anymore. Because there's a new law that says a tenant cannot complain to the landlord about mold until they tell you about the mold, give you a chance to get rid of it. They can't just say, oh, I'm sick from the mold. Well, you should have told me as soon as there was the mold. Second, landlord cannot be held liable even then if the reason there's mold on the property is because the tenant doesn't take care of the property. So it's caused by tenant negligence, right? So those are good things for landlords when it comes to mold. Now let's talk about bad news. It's not that bad, but let's say you're a landlord, you have an apartment building, a couple units, and one of your units has a pest problem. I don't mean the mother-in-law. I mean there's like, you know, there's like, you know, there's like insects, there's termites or something like that. So the landlord wants to, I don't need to hire anybody, I'm going to go get some pesticide and spray. The new law says, and this is also effective January 1st, if a landlord wants to apply a pesticide without a professional, you have to send a notice to the tenant before you do it, telling them what pest are you after, what pesticide are you going to use, what's the toxicity of this pesticide, how long are you going to do it, when's it, et cetera, et cetera. If you hire a professional, you don't have to do any of this. But you do it yourself, and, you, and if it's a sprayer or a fogger, you have to notify tenant above, below, and each side also. And if you're going to do this in the common area of the rental property, you have to post a notice in the common area with this information at least 24 hours before you start 
and it has to stay there until at least 24 hours after you're done. Once again, if you use a professional, none of this applies. If you want to do it yourself. What about if you've got it in your lease that the tenants are responsible for that? Yeah, I mean, you don't have to necessarily do it. I'm just saying if you decide to do it, if the landlord decides to do it, that's when you uh, you have to you have to do this. By the way, that leads to an interesting question. What if the tenant's responsibility is and the tenant sprays, but the tenant sprays too much and poisons all the neighbors? <laughs> the landlord will have liability, I guarantee you. So be careful about authorizing your tenants to take steps like that. Make sure make sure you put some if they do it, they gotta tell you first and tell you what they're doing and blah, 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 because you, you will have indirect liability on that. By the way, speaking of landlords, can landlords prohibit pets? Yes. Can landlords prohibit service animals? No. We all know those rules, but then there's a third category, comfort animals. Tenant goes to the doctor and says, I'm not feeling very good. But if I had a pit bull, I'd feel pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I don't need service. I'm not disabled. I just, for emotional support, I need a Great Dane. I need a German Shepherd. So they show up one day with the pit bull and say, meet my pit bull. And the landlord says, no pit bulls. I mean, I don't have insurance for pit bulls. The property's just not for that. Who wins that argument? Nobody knows. We're waiting for one of you to be the test case. <laughs> the Department of Fair Housing promised that this year they would come up with regulations addressing this issue. In other words, under what circumstances must a landlord allow any comfort animal? What are the restrictions? And we know what a service animal is. A service animal is trained to provide a service to someone with a specific disability, you're entitled to proof that the tenant has the disability, you're entitled to proof that the it's a trained service animal. We know that. But comfort animals, they're not trained, they're just doing what they do. They're providing emotional support. So the Fair Housing Department says we're going to come out with the regs this year, so we're looking forward for the regs. Then they say we're not doing it this year. You'll be happy to know that you guys at CAR said enough waiting on this, so CAR is sponsoring legislation. So that would override the Department of Fair Health. This is a law to regulate what is a comfort animal, what is not a comfort animal, and what is, under what circumstances can a landlord say that's not a reasonable comfort animal. So we're finally going to have some rules, but we don't have them yet. This won't be till next year. What about between now and then? You want to be the test case? Go ahead. Otherwise, uh, what about the insurance companies? That's the thing. What about the insurance companies? Well, I mean. That's the they, problem. They control. Right, because you want to have insurance on your property. The tenant says, I don't care about your stupid insurance company. I want a pit bull. And my medical professional, who's my physical therapist, my medical professional says, I get a pit bull. So you can't stop me. See, that's the case we've been waiting for. And we're going to have legislation, but we're still in the, in the gray area. You can do that for pets, not for service animals, but you can't. That's the whole thing. I mean, the, the point is for a pet, you don't, have to allow, you don't have to allow the pet at all. So since you don't have to allow it at all, you can put any restrictions on it you want. If you want to have a pet, you have twice the rent, pet deposit, pet insurance. But since you can't restrict service animals, you can't put any, make it harder for them to have them either. That's the, that's the issue. Like I said, the issue, though, is comfort animals. We're going to have a resolution next year, but not this year. So that's, that's where we are still. Yeah, unless, unless it's a service animal. Yeah, absolutely. You can just say, get out of here. You're violating the lease. Three-day notice. All right. Um, anything else on rentals? The only other one on rentals I would mention is... Um, did you know that tenants can get out of a lease if they are a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, elder abuse, or human trafficking? So they can tell you, I'm a victim, let me out of my lease. First question is, what type of proof do they have to give you? A temporary restraining order, a protective order, or simply a police report? 
The next question is, how much notice do they have to give you? Well, that, that's what changed. This, the notice has now been shortened from 30 days to 14 days. They only got to give you two weeks notice. This law was supposed to expire at the end of this year. It's now been expanded to be permanent law. So this is a permanent law now. Tenants can get out of a lease. By the way, let's say you're a landlord and you have a tenant and you want to evict the tenant. How much notice do you have to give them? It depends, right? If they've been there less than a year, 30 days. If they've been there at least a year, 60 days. If they were there when the property was foreclosed on 90 days. If they're Section 8 tenants, 150 days. If you live in Santa Monica or San Francisco, five or 10 years. You know, it's going <laughs> to, if you're lucky. But, um, but an interesting question is, how much notice do you have to give a tenant at the end of a lease? So they have a year lease. You don't really want to expend, extend it beyond that. How much notice do you have to give them at the end of the lease? Zero. No notice. You're exactly right. But they don't know that, right? So the tenant's gonna, not going to leave unless you actually tell them. So you know what we, we came up with? We have a sample letter now. Courtesy letter to tenant telling them to vacate upon expiration of the lease. Did you know we have a library on zip form of sample legal letters? That, that any situation where you normally would have to hire a lawyer to write a proper letter, we have them. So check it out. That's the latest letter we have. Notice to loser to, no, don't say that. Notice to tenant to vacate upon expiration of lease. It, it's well written, looks very nice. It's a good line. Just take it. You have the right to do it. Notice of Leonard, receipt of, of yes. Uh huh. Right. Right. Because of, yeah. Even if they weren't paying rent, though? See, I don't think that's right. I mean, the point is, related to that, you cannot evict a tenant because they're a victim of domestic violence. In other words, normally you don't need a reason to evict a tenant. But there's certain reasons you can't evict them for. So maybe you have a tenant who's been, your tenant's been involved in domestic violence, even if they were the victim, you know, six times. You say, I'm tired of these people. Let's just get rid of them. You can't. But that's why I'm surprised about it. They actually don't pay rent. That's... That's weird. That doesn't make sense. Right. Right. Well, that's just like any, any, any tenant can always say that. Yeah, you don't have to give them any more notice. Right. In other words, you don't have to give them any notice at all. You don't have to give them this letter. And if on the day of the end of the lease, they're still there, you can start the eviction that day. This is just a courtesy to give it to them beforehand, just to sort of remind them. But yeah, you don't have to give it. Yeah, the courts don't don't require a notice. Yeah. No. Right. Right. Yes. Right. You don't have to give it at all. So you give the letter a week before, to, whatever you think is reasonable. But there's no requirement to even do it. The point is, we have a letter. What if you have squatters, and um, can you post uh, or send that letter to John Doe, Jane Doe, one through ten, whatever? You don't even know how many people. Yeah. The question is, what if you have squatters? I mean, ideally, you'd think the police would just throw these criminals off your property. Well, there's a trial law in certain cities, not Bakersfield, where you can actually, when you, have a vac when you own a vacant property, you can send a notice to law enforcement. And once law enforcement is in receipt of this notice, once you find out later you have squatters on the property, you can notify the law enforcement and they'll kick them out. There won't be an eviction. But on a normal case in Bakersfield and everywhere else, except for these three cities, squatters are tenants in the eyes of the police, so you have to evict them. Um, of course it is. It's terrible. But that's just the way it is right now. So maybe this pilot program will be expanded beyond that, and we'll all be 
have a better way to deal with squatters, okay? But anyway, uh, that's pretty much it on rentals. We could talk all day about rentals, I'm sure. Uh, but let's, uh, those are the only laws that you really need to know about this year on rentals. Next topic, homeowner associations. A couple of these are also related to rentals. I think I told you last year, remember I told you last year that there's a law that says you have to allow tenants and you have to allow people in homeowner associations to engage in personal agriculture. Remember that? That doesn't mean they can grow marijuana. It means they can grow tomato plants in portable containers. You can't stop them. Well, there's another new one this year. You ready for this? You have to allow your tenants and the HOA have to allow the people that live there to, to be able to put up clotheslines in the backyard. Not the front yard, the backyard. <clears throat> But you cannot have a landlord that says no. You can say not on the balcony, not on the patio, but if they have a yard, you can't stop them from putting up. You have a constitutional right to a clothesline in California. <laughs> I don't know what the what the reasoning for that is, but there you go. Apparently, there's a problem out there with people not being allowed to use their clotheslines. So there you go. All right. That applies to landlords and also applies to HOAs. Yes. Then that's too bad for them. Get a get a dryer. Go to the laundromat. They don't have a yard. Yes. Yeah. Can you restrict the height to where it cannot be seen above? Yeah, that's a good question. You can't say no clotheslines, but can you have reasonable restrictions on what type of clotheslines or how high the clothesline? I think, yes, reasonable restriction. Similarly, um, you know, there's another law. Okay, we're in a drought. You all know this. And there's rela laws related to that. There's a law that says, last year the law said, HOAs may not prevent the person in the HOA who has their own vegetation, their own lawn, to tear out their lawn and put in, you know, vegetation that uses less water. Okay. That was expanded this year to say, in fact, HOA can't stop you from ripping out the grass and replacing it with completely artificial stuff, astroturf or crushed rock or something. And, and the landscaping guidelines cannot stop you from doing this. But... The association can have reasonable restrictions, like if you want to have AstroTurf, you got to have this AstroTurf. You know what I mean? So they, they can't stop you, but they can reasonably restrict you. What, what, no, 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 tenants. Now I'm back to HOAs. Tenants, forget, this, this one is not tenants. Now I'm just HOAs. HOAs and dealing with drought. So they can put in I mean, I assume if, I mean, I guess... Like I said, the HOA, the board of directors could say, well, we have a, our guideline is if you want to have AstroTurf, you can only use this AstroTurf or whatever it, whatever it is. But the point is you can't, they can't stop you from ripping it out and replacing it with something like that. Well, what about when the drought is over? Can they require you to put the grass back? And the answer is no. Anything you do during the drought, even if it violates the guidelines or landscaping guidelines, it's, you can't be forced to put it back the other way once the drought is over, as we all hope it will be over one day. Yes? My HOA requires that any, all the front yards maintained by the HOA. Uh, you cannot do anything in that front unless you petition the architectural committee and get permission. Do you have to do that? I don't think so. If the HOA, your HOA says you can't do anything without the permission of the architectural committee. If what you want to do is rip out the grass and replace it with something else, the only thing the architectural committee could say is, well, we have guidelines for AstroTurf. But they can't just say, no, it's got to be something that, that's grass that's living there. That's the point. Okay? All right. One more thing on HOAs. Starting this year, starting next year, in the annual re budget report of the HOA, they have to disclose if the property <coughs> is FHA or VA approved right in the annual budget so that make it easier for you to figure out <clears throat> if the property is approved so that's that's interesting okay so we've covered bre we've covered transfer on death deed we've covered new laws on rentals we've covered new laws on homeowner associations is there anything else that you really need to know i would say maybe one other thing and that is 
Um, any of you in this room who have employees, you could be a broker and you have staff. You could be just a realtor and you have an assistant. Do you know if you have a realtor and you have an assistant, that assistant is probably an employee? Because you have to ask yourself, my assistant, do I tell my assistant what to do, where to do it, and when to do it? That's an employee. Now, if it's a transaction coordinator and I just give her, give her, the, give her the file and say, just tell me when you're done, that's, you can have that person as an independent contract because you're not telling them exactly where to be, when to be there. You understand the distinction? Anyway, once you figure out that you actually have an employee, remember we have this new law now on paid sick leave. For every, and I'll say, oh, it doesn't, does it apply to part-time? No, but here's how they define part-time versus full-time. If they work for you at least 30 days in a year, they're not part-time. A whole year, 30 days. Okay. Well, they only work half days. It doesn't matter. They work 30 days. I don't care if they're half days. If they work at least 30 days, they're not part-time. Okay, once you've established you have an employee and they're not part-time, what do you got to do? We well, have choices. One possibility is you got to keep track of every hour they work, and for every 30, they get one paid sick time. But if that's too cumbersome or kind of a pain, there's another option now. You can give them the sick time up front as a lump sum, and then you have to keep track of anything. And you only have to give them 24 hours a year. So you could say to your employee on January 1st, you have three sick days this year. Of course, they can use them the next three days and then quit. <laughs> but that's probably not going to happen. And by giving them up front a lump sum, you don't have to keep track of how many hours they work and keep track of how many do they have now, how many have they used, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a way to make it easier for bookkeeping purposes if you want to. Otherwise, you got to keep track. Every 30 hours, they have a paid sick time. Well, what if they accumulate a lot of sick time and then they leave? Do you have to pay them when they leave? No. But if they leave and come back within a year, you got to reinstate the sick time they had accumulated before they leave, left. Okay? That's good. You don't have to pay them. You don't have to pay them. Ah, you're crazy enough to hire relatives as your assistant. Okay, same rules apply. Yeah, no special rule just because you happen to be married to this person or something. No, you got to pay your spouse sick time. Yes, <clears throat> carry what over? Yeah, they can keep accumulating it. Yeah, now you can cap them at six days. For the accumulation, but still, yeah, they can, they can, they can use it. They can, they, they can keep using it. I mean, they can go beyond the, uh, the, the that calendar year. Okay, all right. That's like my top ten laws. Let's talk about forms. Forms that are going to change on December fourteenth. If you want this in writing, like I said, my risk management report will be on the website within a week. Do you know how many forms are currently on zip form? Thousands, right? Uh, I don't even know how many myself, like 300. I lose track. Well, guess what? They're going to be eight more. Aren't you excited? Um, I'll tell you what they are. None of them, you, you're going to say, that's not a big deal. That's not a big deal. OK, here's the eight new forms coming out December 14th. Let me ask you something. In Kern County, do you have any farms? In other words, you're selling a house, you're selling a property that has a residence and a farm. It's part of a farm, right? Do you know we've never had a, a form for that? So what people ask, what purchase kind of do I use if I'm purchasing a house on a farm? I mean, we have the commercial, we have the vacant land, but we, I don't know. Here's what's coming up. There's going to be a new agricultural addendum designed for buying farm property with a residence on it. So you would use the RPA plus the agricultural addendum, and that we think that's going to be the right form to use in that circumstance. OK? So that's one new form. Second new form is going to be arbitration agreement. Very simple. It's the arbitration clause on a page. You ever have the buyer and seller, sometimes they don't 
they don't initial the arbitration clause, but then they change their mind later and they say, oh, I wish we'd initial the arbitration clause because now we really hate each other and we're probably going to sue each other. Better to go to arbitration. Well, you can have them sign this in the middle of the transaction. It's just arbitration agreement. It's just it, it's just the arbitration clause on a piece of, on a separate piece of paper. Okay, that's two forms. Um, the other next two are just nothing new at all. At all, sorry. No, no, no. But a lot of times people, they, they, at the time they opened escrow, they didn't initial the arbitration for some reason. RPA. On the RPA. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to initial the arbitration clause on the RPA. Sometimes you choose not to, but then you, but then you change your mind later and say, I wish we had initialed the arbitration clause. They'll be able to easily incorporate that into the escrow, even though escrow is already open with this form. Okay? Yeah. It'd be just like the arbitration clause being initialed in the original contract. I mean, it's, it's, this is all optional. You don't have to do this. Okay? All right. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's whatever. If you want to, you don't have to use it. I mean, you guys have obviously survived your whole life without this form up until now. So don't change doing what you, if what you do now works. Yeah. I mean, the point is there's farm property has issues like Williamson Act, the Right to Farm Act, toxic issues. So it just, it's just, it just has some nice issues there. So okay. One APM, one APM then. Yes, right, right. Okay, so that's two forms. Next two, very simple. You know how last year we introduced that form called the Representative Capacity Signature Disclosure? So if you're writing the offer on behalf of a trust or a corporation or a partnership, or if you're the seller and you're the, an estate or a partnership, or you attach this to your offer or your acceptance. The only change that's happening is that form is going to be split into a buyer's version and a seller's version. Right now, there's just one for buyer or seller. Now, there's a buyer version, seller version. Obviously, no big deal at all. So that's four forms. Next two, purchase contracts. Do you know how many purchase contracts are on zip form? Eight. The RPA, residential income, new construction, vacant land, commercial, mobile homes, probate, and then the notice of default purchase agreement if you're representing an investor buying a house in foreclosure. Okay. Eight, though. Wouldn't it be better if you had a round number like 10? <laughs> I think so. So there's going to be two new purchase contracts, but they're very specific. And you can tell what they're used for by the name. One is going to be called the Condo Conversion Purchase Agreement. You know what a condo conversion is. You've got an apartment building, and all the tenants get together and say, let's turn these into condos. There's a process. You've got to go through the BRE. And the BRE says, when you first time you sell off these properties, you have to use a special form. CAR has never had that form. You've had to use the builder's form or developer's form. We didn't have a form that was legally satisfactory to purchase, to be the first purchaser of a condo conversion, and now we will. We're going to have a condo conversion purchase agreement that satisfies all the BRE requirements. And then the other new form is called the completed subdivision purchase agreement. Right now, you got a builder, he's got a subdivision, he starts selling off the new homes. Those first sales have to have special language in the contract. We don't have a form like that. We have a new construction purchase agreement, but that's for buying like a one-off or buying a spec home or something like that. We don't have, until now, a form that can be used to make offers on, com on just completed subdivisions. Up until now, you had to use the builder form because we didn't have a form. Now we're going to have a form. So there you go. Ten purchase contracts. A nice round number. All right. So that's six new forms, right? Arbitration, ag, the splitting of the, of the uh, representative capacity signature disclosure, and the two new purchase contracts. Two more new forms. One of them I've already alluded to. It's called the salesperson-owned fictitious business name agreement. Remember I said a little while ago that it is now legal for a salesperson to own a DBA? and take it from place to place. This is the contract where the broker will actually authorize the agent to own the DBA. Because it's still up to the broker. The broker doesn't have to allow this. But if the broker allows this, this is the form 
where the broker tells the salesperson, you get the DBA and it belongs to you. Okay? Yes? Good question. Completely different. If you're a broker associate, you can get your own DBA and that's yours. Do whatever you want with it. You can go wherever you want on your own. Of course, if you work for a broker also, your broker could say, you want to work for me, these are my rules. But as far as the BRE is concerned, you can obviously get your own DBA and, and take and start your own company all of a sudden because you have a broker's license. Okay? All right. The eighth and final new form is kind of interesting. It's called the DNA. <laughs> Who remembers from high school biology what DNA stands for? Yes? You wanna, anyone want to guess? Yeah? No, not do not ask. No one remembers high school biology? No one wants to try to take a shot? Very, very good. Deoxyribonucleic acid. This new form, it doesn't stand for that, okay? It doesn't stand for that. It, sta it doesn't stand for do not ask either. It stands for delivery of notices addendum. Here's the issue. Now, you, once I tell you this, you may say, I don't need that form. And you probably don't. But here's the issue. The, the purchase contract says, throughout the contract, it says, it uses the word deliver. Seller must deliver NHD reports. Seller must deliver disclosures. Seller must deliver termite reports. Seller must deliver, deliver, deliver. It also says buyer must deliver uh, proof of funds. Buyer must deliver prequalification. Buyer must deliver contingency removal. So throughout escrow, you have to deliver thing to the other side. Okay. The purchase contract defines the word deliver as you sent it and it was personally received. Which means, if I'm a buyer in escrow and I deliver a contingency removal to you, it's not effective until you receive it. So if I send it by email, what makes it, what does personal receive an email? Opening the email. So I send you the email and you, and you don't open it for some reason. I haven't sent it. I haven't met my deadline. Sometimes an agent will get something from you and say, oh, I don't like that person. I'm not going to open that email. By not opening your email, they have prevented you from delivering the document that you were supposed to do. Now, maybe this has never happened to you. Maybe every time in your, I hope so. I hope every time you've delivered something, the other side opens it and, and gets it. So maybe this is a non-issue for you. But once in a while it happens and people get very upset. So, this new optional form, the DNA, optional. If you choose to, it, it would be signed by the buyer, the seller, the listing agent, and the selling agent. You'd all sign it. And if you sign it, what you're all for agreeing is, if we're going to send each other stuff by email, it's considered delivered the day after I send it, whether you open it or not. In other words, it's introducing the concept of deemed delivery. Delivery is deemed effective. All I have to do is prove that I sent it to the email address you gave me on this form. I don't have to prove that you opened it. All I got to do is prove that I sent it. If I can prove that, it's effective the day after I sent it. Okay? So, um, Delivery of notices addendum. Delivery of notices addendum. It's completely optional. You may say to yourself, I've never run into this issue. I don't think it's a problem. In which case, don't use the form. Maybe none of you will use this form. But enough people have complained that this sometimes happens, that there's now a form. By the way, some of you may remember, we used to have a similar form for this, the RDN. Receipt and delivery of notices. This is a, this is the new improved version of that form. Okay, like I said, you may not need it, but there you go. Yes. Well, I doubt if I were the agent, the other one wasn't going to sign. I probably wouldn't want to sign it either. I'm, I'm not, but I, theoretically, it could be one agent says, "Okay, if I send it, I have to prove that you opened it. If you send it, you all you have to do is prove that you sent it." I mean, to me, it's. They're probably not going to want to do that unless they both want to do it. But theoretically, it's possible that one, one side could agree to and the other side couldn't. Doesn't the notice to perform default? The notice to buy or to perform or something like that? Yeah, if you send a notice to perform. Right. They don't have to respond to that. Once you give them that notice, you 
give them notice, right? Well, that's a good question. Under the current contract, there's a form called the notice to buyer to perform. So you give them that form. What if you send it by email? And what if they don't open it? You haven't sent it. That's my whole point. That's, you need this form if you're having a problem with it. the other side saying, I never got it. Maybe this never, ha maybe, like I said, maybe it's not an issue for you. But enough times it happens where the other agent says, what notice to perform? I never got your notice to perform. This is going to solve that problem because you don't have to, it, it's not, no longer is, will it be the burden on the sender to prove that the recipient got it. It'll just be, all you have to prove as the sender is that you sent it. Then they would sort of have the burden of proof that you didn't send it. Oh, this could be done any time. Uh, any time during the escrow, before the contract. That's a good question. The question is, when, when would I sign this form? And it, whenever you feel like signing this form. There's no time on it. No, no. I'm sorry? Yeah. You can deliver things personally. Yeah, that's personal receipt. If you deliver something in person, you still want someone to acknowledge it though, right? Or take your cell phone and take a selfie <laughs> of you giving it to the, take out your phone, here, yeah, I have a picture of me. Yeah. In other words, the point is under the current form, technically you, you would have to prove personal receipt. It could be delivering it in person. It could be you emailed it and they opened the email. It could be you faxed it to them. It could be you fax to them and they text you back. Yeah, I got your fax. Just in the back of your mind, though, you have to have some. If it comes down to them saying, I never got that thing you said you sent me, you would have the burden of proof to prove that they actually got it. All this form would do would be reverse the burden of proof. You wouldn't have to prove that they got it. All you'd have to prove is that they, you sent it. Or what if you want to send it by snail mail? Same thing. You don't have to prove that they received it. All you have to prove is that you went to the post office and got a proof of mailing. The fact that they didn't open their mail, that's not your problem. You can prove you mailed it. In other words, so when you fill out this form, you're going to put a mailing address and an email address. And you're saying to the other side, if you can prove you sent it either to my mailing address or that email address, you did it. I don't have, you don't have to prove that I opened it or received it or et cetera. Yeah, facts with a confirmation. Yeah. I take two copies, I deliver them to the receptionist, and I have the receptionist acknowledge receipt on my copy. Her comment is, what she's been doing is delivering it, taking in person a copy directly to the receptionist. I don't know if that would hold up in court, because the what it says on the purchase counter is, is actually you put the name of the agent there. Now, if you put on the on the contract delivery to anyone at my company is delivery to me, that's fine. But the way the courts have interpreted our purchase contract is when you have to deliver it to the other side, you've got to deliver it to the name of the agent on that last page. Or Well, yeah, or the broker, if you put the broker's name there, which I'm sure you always do. So on the, you know that box on the bo on the last page, you put the name of the brokerage and you put your name. That's who you send it to. Now, what if, by the way, what if you have a team of agents, and and it's okay to give it to anybody on the team? That's when you got to use that additional agent acknowledgement form, which is basically saying to the other side, these are all the agents working on this deal. If you want to deliver something, deliver it to all of, any of them. But maybe you just want everything to be delivered to your transaction coordinator or something like that. You can put that on the contract too. Delivery means transaction coordinator. You control it when you write the contract. That's the point. Yeah. I think when I think I would now that I this form is to me is part of the listing contract. Just get it signed. You can get it signed up front. The minute you are if you're representing a buyer, you get it signed and say, if we're gonna do this deal together. This is in place. Yeah, I think that made sense to, to do it up front if you're going to do it. Did you still have a question? Yeah, so you don't have to do it up front and then again do it notice to perform. Right. Again, Once it's signed, it's signed, it, it covers the, the whole transaction. By the way, though, this does not cover 
before you get into the transaction. For example, the negotiation of the offer and acceptance. So you still have this issue. You get an offer for three hundred thousand. You send a counter at three twenty. Then you get a new offer at three fifty. You tell your seller, "What do you want to do?" And the seller says, "Can we take the three fifty? Sure, you can. As long as that counter offer doesn't come back with a three twenty, you can accept the three fifty. So the seller signs the three fifty, and they email it back to the second agent. But the second agent doesn't open that email right away because he's taking a nap or something. But the first agent, five minutes later, gets the buyer to sign the three twenty counter, comes back to you, and you're dumb enough to open your email. No, he doesn't. In other words, by opening the email, you just sold it for three twenty, not three fifty. You don't need to, unless it's a multiple counter offer form. You do not need the seller to re-sign it. Yeah, I'm not talking about a multiple. I'm talking about a regular counter. So, what's the moral of that story? Just don't open email, right? <laughs> or better yet, before you accept the three fifty, send that first buyer a revocation of the counter offer. The problem is, how are you going to send that? By email. Then they're going to see what it is. I'm not opening that email. I don't want that one. And then you're in the same problem. And none of this is solved by the DNA form that I just talked about, because you're not going to sign the DNA until you have a purchase contract. And right now, I'm just talking about negotiating the purchase contract. So when you're negotiating the purchase contract, you have the same issue. If you send things electronically, you better be able to prove that they got it. The offer. Right. Is that enough? Or did they if you can it? prove that they got your text, what if they say my phone wasn't working? I don't know. You sent it to the wrong text number. You understand the issue now, right? This is an issue. All right. Let's now talk about instead of so those are the eight new forms. Let's talk about the forms that you already have that might change. Go ahead. Yeah. There are so many forms on there that they have been replaced, and you go in not remembering the new number, right? Click on it, and it tells you this form has been replaced by whatever. Why don't they give you the option to hide the forms that are no longer so they're not in the list? And if anybody wants to look for one, then they can look for it. Good question. Call customer service. <laughs> Don't be bothering me with those problems. <clears throat> I'm not zip form. What do you think I am? But those are good. Good point. Okay. Anyway, let's talk about forms that are going to change on December 14th. The forms you already have, but they're going to change slightly. These are not big changes. Let's first talk about the big three. What are the big three? The listing form, the lease form, and the purchase agreement. Okay. Is anything going to change on your listing form on December 14th? Nothing significant. There's one sort of significant thing, and that is, you know when you take a listing and then it expires, but if someone who you introduce to the property during the listing buys it after the listing, you still get paid as long as you registered that those names of the people you introduce to the property. The current form says your deadline to submit that names is three days after the listing expires. It's going to change to your deadline is the day the listing expires. No more extra three days. You've got to submit that list to the seller by the last day of your listing. Okay, That's the only significant change. I think a, a minor change is the listing form is going to specifically authorize you to order stuff for your clients. I suspect you already do that. For example, the NHD report, who normally orders that? Escrow does? Not you? Sometimes you do it though, right? Well, you know what? You've never had the authority to do it. Now you will. So what you've been doing illegally all along is, is going to be okay. All right? <laughs> Um, one other change worth mentioning is, you know, let's say you're listing a mobile home or you're listing a probate. We have a probate listing form. We have a mobile home listing form. But you're going to have an option now of, instead of using that form, there's just going to be sort of an add-on at the end, if you know what I'm saying. In other words, the only difference between the probate listing and the mobile home listing and the regular listing is just a couple little things. So now what you'll be able to do, if it's a probate listing, you use the regular listing form and then check a box at the very end which says, since it's, a, since it's a probate, this stuff applies. 
or since it's a mobile home, this stuff applies. You won't have to use a whole separate, different form. You'd be using the regular same listing form with a little thing at the end. We'll have the same impact as if you use the whole separate form. That's not a big deal, but I, that's, a, that's a nice little change there. Okay, those are the changes for the listing form that are happening December 14th. How about changes to the lease form? Let's get back to rentals. I was talking about rentals before. Changes to the CAR lease form. Um, I think there's only two things worth mentioning. One of them is it's going to say that the tenant may not have a portable washing machine or portable dishwasher without the landlord's permission. Because apparently those sometimes cause problems. And the other one is, I like this one as a landlord, is that there's going to be a cap on attorney fees of $1,000. Here's what I mean by that. You know what an attorney fees clause says? That's a clause where two people in the contract say, if we ever sue each other, the winner not only wins, but the loser pays the winner's attorney fees. The problem with that on a lease is we've noticed, here's what some jerk tenants are doing. They have like a $50 problem with you. So they sue you for $50. And then they hire an attorney who charges like $10,000 of attorney fees to represent them on this $50 case. And then, of course, you got to pay the... You got to pay them the fifty dollars and the ten thousand dollar attorney fees, which they, of course, the attorney kicks back to them. It's such a scam, but they won't be able to do that anymore. There'll be a maximum of a thousand dollars that the loser pays in a landlord-tenant lawsuit, and usually that's going to help the landlords because usually the lawsuits come from the tenant. Landlords you usually probably evict someone. You rarely sue them. Uh, for a lot of money. So that's a good thing for landlords right there. Okay, now let's go to the purchase agreement, the RPA. What is changing on the RPA? I know you're saying, oh God, you just changed that form last year. No changes. Well, there's not much. Two things have already changed this year. You may not even have noticed. I'll tell you what they are first. First change is on the uh, cash buyer. Have you ever had a cash buyer who turns out not to be a cash buyer? Isn't that obnoxious? They say they're paying cash, then all of a sudden they're getting a loan. So the whole reason I took your cash out because you're cash. Okay. And then even worse is they say they're cash, then they try to get a loan anyway, and then they don't qualify for the loan. And then they say, I can't buy your house. Loan contingency. Did you notice the change that was made during the year? It's, it now says when they check the box that says they're paying cash, by doing that, they've removed their loan contingency. So it's automatic. So they better have the cash. Because if they try to get a loan and they can't get the loan, they have no legal way out of the deal, unlike a loan buyer. Okay, So cash buyers have automatically removed their loan contingency. That's a good thing. The second thing that changed was a sort of a clarification in the disclosure paragraph. <clears throat> you know how disclosure, you know you have the transfer disclosure statement, and then you have the seller property questionnaire, right? And you know they're, they're tied together. The, the purchase contract now requires the TDS and the seller property questionnaire. But you know, some sellers are exempt, aren't they? Who's an exempt seller? Is it REO sale, probate sale, bankruptcy sale, new house, or a sale by a trustee of a trust, right? So what are those sellers exempt from? They're exempt from the TDS. They're also exempt from the seller property questionnaire. But did you know they're not exempt from the SSD, the Supplemental Statutory Disclosure? That form is always required. Well, how come I don't do that form on every deal? Because that form has been incorporated into the seller property questionnaire. So on a quote-unquote normal deal where there's a TDS, there's also a seller property questionnaire, you don't worry about the SSD. But if you're exempt from the TDS and therefore exempt from the seller property questionnaire, now you still have to go back and do the SSD. That wasn't crystal clear, I don't think, and now it's crystal clear on the contract. But guess what's going to happen on December 14th? They're going to change the name of the SSD. Right, right now, what does that stand for? Supplemental Statutory Disclosures. What are they going to change the name to? They're going to change the name to the Exempt Seller Disclosure. 
So it's going to change from SSD to ESD. I like that because that reminds you that this is the form I use when my seller's exempt. In fact, that's the only time you're going to use that form, when the seller is exempt. Because a normal seller who's not exempt is going to do a TDS and an SPQ, which means they've taken care of that form. So SSD change to ESD is going to happen December 14th. So like what she was saying, so if you hit SSD, it's going to default to this. I don't know how zip form works. Don't ask me these <laughs> zip form questions. You know how zip form works a lot better than I do, okay? I should probably know that stuff, but I don't, all right? So, um, okay. By the way, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, I just said a seller who's a trustee of a trust is exempt. Okay. Now, not all trusts are exempt. The law says, if you're the trustee of a trust, you're exempt. However, if the trustee that we're talking about has ever been on title or has lived in the property during the last 12 months, they're all of a sudden not exempt anymore. So what about you have a husband and wife, they've lived in this house for 20 years, they own it, they live in it, they still live it, but they decide for estate planning purposes to put it into a living trust. And they're both the trustees. Are they exempt from disclosure? Believe it or not, they are. You know why? Because this the only time they're not exempt is if it's a sole trustee. It's one of the dumbest laws in real estate. So if one of the two is designated as the sole trustee, they're not exempt. But if they're both trustees, they're exempt. Now, we're, this is probably going to change next year because this is such a stupid law, such a stupid distinction that CAR is sponsoring legislation to change it, to say, basically, I don't care if there's one trustee or two trustees, if either one of them has already own the house in the past, they're not exempt. So the only trustee that would be exempt would be a true successor trustee that has no connection to the house. Any trustee who's lived there in the last 12 months or ever been on title, whether it's one of them or two of them, they should have to do it because they're just like any other seller. But right now, believe it or not, the weird loss says you're not exempt if you're a sole trustee, but you're exempt if it's more than one trustee. It's crazy, but that's what the law says. Okay? Ever, ever, ever. That's right, and they might not know. Which leads to another question: What do you do if you're if you're selling a property that you haven't seen for twenty years? Maybe you're a landlord. Or maybe it's an out of state rental or out of county rental. You have you, you haven't even seen this property for twenty years, but you're not exempt. You know because you, you know you're just you're not exempt. It's not a question of, it's not a trust or something like that, or maybe it's a trust or it used to be on time. Anyway, you're not exempt, but you don't know anything. How do you fill out the disclosures? You say, I don't know. But you, but you have to answer every single question. Because here's a recent case. Seller didn't answer all the questions on the TDS. Gave it to the buyer. Buyer signs it. But the law says when you give someone a TDS, they have a three-day right of rescission. That's regardless of whether they've removed their contingencies or not. So I hope you know that if the buyer removes all their contingencies, but you don't give them the TDS until a week before closing, they can now walk away from the deal. But in this case, the seller gave the buyer the TDS up front like they're supposed to, but didn't answer all the questions. Deal went on, buyer removed their contingencies. Two days before close, the buyer says, I'm canceling, give me back my money. Seller says, I don't have to give you back your money. You removed all your contingencies and et cetera, et cetera. Buyer says, no, I'm still exercising my three-day right of rescission because I still haven't got a complete TDS because your seller didn't answer every question. And the buyer won the case. Moral of the story, make sure your sellers answer every single question on the TDS. What if they don't know the answer? They check no. You know what a lot of sellers do? I've seen you write in, I don't, you write in the words, I don't know. 
That's not really necessary because the, the way the question is worded, it says, are you aware? I don't know. Then put no, you're not aware. You're not saying the answer is no. You're just saying as far as you know. You're not saying it's no. You're saying I'm not aware. Right. So let's talk about the sellers out of state. Would it make sense for page one when you've got all the boxes to check off about what the house has or features that the agent could go through and this would be between the agent and the seller. The agent would go through and make a list, give the seller, and the seller could check the box. See, that's a good question. This case I talked about, I hope you understand what he's saying. I'll repeat what he's saying. What I was talking about is page two of the TDS, like he said, all the yes and no questions. What about the page one of the TDS where all these check boxes and you have the seller who doesn't know? Unfortunately, we haven't had that case yet. I don't want any of you to be the test case on that one. So maybe his idea is a good one. Maybe if the seller really is so not aware of the property, the seller doesn't know what it has and what it hasn't. I don't know what this best... So I could just write in big letters, I don't know what this house has. I can't imagine that being a problem, but and based on this previous case, maybe a, a judge would say that's an incomplete TDS, but it's, it's, I know it's okay to say I don't know. So maybe they have to write the words I don't know next to every box. Maybe like you said, the agent gives the seller the list, by the way, it has these, it doesn't have these. That's an excellent question, which when I say it's an excellent question, that's because there's no answer. Um, I mean, we've never seen all the years I've been in real estate, we haven't ever seen that issue come up in a case where the seller just doesn't fill it in because the seller doesn't know. I think if the seller makes it very clear on that page, I've never lived in the house, I have no idea if it's got a dishwasher or not. In my gut feeling is that's not a problem. But like I said, there was a case on the page two of the TDS where the seller didn't answer every question, and the court said, well, that was incomplete, and the buyer has a right of rescission. In my opinion, that's okay. Right. I think that's okay. I just don't... One of you will be the test case on that one of these days, you know. But I think that's good. You're exempt unless you were living there in the last 12 months. Yeah. And I assume this child who grew up there didn't, was never on title. And if they moved out more than 12 months ago, they're exempt. Of course, think about it. That trustee who's lived there for 25 years up until a year and a half ago, they know a heck of a lot about the property. They may not have to fill out the TDS, but they have to disclose everything they know. So it may even be easier to fill out the TDS to satisfy their basic disclosure obligation. Explanations are not required. Yeah. So you say yes and you don't give an explanation. That's, that's not in and of itself insufficient. Right. Right. The notoriously, REOs think they're exempt from everything. They're not. One of the things they're not exempt from in California is the SSD, which is going to be the ESD in a month. What's appropriate for them? Well, if your REO seller refuses to fill it out, they refuse to fill it out. I mean, they're setting themselves up to get sued. Now, interesting, the SSD doesn't trigger a three-day right of rescission. So the fact that the buyer doesn't get the SSD doesn't give the buyer the right to cancel because there is no mandatory three-day right of rescission. But of course, the buyer could end up suing the seller. That was, there was something important you should have told me. That's a misrepresentation, but there's no right of rescission issue. Okay. By the way, speaking of this right of rescission, another thing, if you took the class I gave last year, you might remember this, but let me just reinforce it. Let's get back to this TDS. Seller signs it listing agent signs it, then you give it to the buyer's agent. Some buyer's agents are like too smart for their own good. And they say to themselves, I'm in no hurry to sign this and give it to the buyer because the longer I delay, my buyer still has their three-day right of rescission. And don't all buyers like the flexibility of being able to cancel anytime they want? 
So buyer's agents would deliberately delay signing their part of the TDS or their AVID. Remember that you can't do that anymore. Because remember what the purchase contract now says. It says all disclosure forms are complete when they are signed by the seller and the listing agent. Buyer's agent signature is not required. So if the listing agent signs the TDS, the seller signs the TDS, you give it to the buyer's agent. As soon as the buyer's agent receives it, the three days starts. So buyer's agent, you have no incentive to delay doing your part of the TDS because the buyer's on the clock as soon as you got it because you just received a complete TDS. And why is it complete? Because it's been signed by the seller and the listing agent. Your signature is not required. All you got to prove is that is when it was received by the buyer's agent. You don't have to prove that it was received by the buyer. You, all you have to do is prove that the buyer's agent received it. That starts the clock. It's back to what I was talking about before. If they're going to deny they never got it, you want something back from them acknowledging that they got it. It's not a question of the law. It's a question of proof. On the TDS, does that satisfy those additional forms? It does. Very, there are two different forms. There's a smoke detector water heater form, right? And there's a carbon monoxide detector form, right? The, the smoke detector water heater has been incorporated onto the TDS now. So by, by the seller signing the TDS, they've signed the smoke detector water heater form. You don't need that form. Why is that form still on zip form? Because if it's an exempt transaction where the seller doesn't sign the TDS, now you still need the seller to sign the smoke detector water heater form. What about the carbon monoxide detector form? That is not required by law. You never actually need that form. It's optional. Yes? Okay. When you are dealing with a short sale, you have a deal involved Get the deal signed on the second property. And I know in my case, I've got all my disclosures down already. I've got them all ready when I did the listing. So I sent them over to the other agent. I had some agents say, We don't think there's any reason to have the buyers sign off on those until the contingency is removed and the short sale. Now, I can understand why the buyer would want to wait until they have an inspection done, appraisal done. Yeah. Here's a question. You, you send the disclosure to the buyer's agent, and the buyer's agent won't get the buyer's signature. First, my point number one is, since you've delivered it to the buyer's agent, you've done your job. It's not your fault if the buyer's agent never gets the buyer to sign it. By delivering it to the buyer's agent, you've met your deadline. The buyer can't say, well, I never got it. Too bad you never got it. Your agent got it. Now, is the buyer, the buyer still supposed to sign them? Yes. It says right in the contract, buyer will sign and return within 17 days. What if the buyer just refuses to? It doesn't affect the seller's rights. The seller can say, I don't care whether you sign or not. I gave it to your agent. I did my job. You don't have a three-day right of rescission. And the fact that it doesn't really matter whether you signed it or not, buyer. Until you get bank approval, and when you've got a contingency, nothing starts running. You don't have a deal until the contingency. Right. So why would they get them early? Their time hasn't started running yet. It doesn't matter. Okay, but I don't care. The point is, if you give it to the buyer's agent up front, even on a short sale, even before you have a deal, even before you have a deal, that's fine too. All that means is you can write, which is what they do, by the way, now in a lot of places in Northern California. It's standard practice. You you put all the disclosures in a package and get hand them out at open houses. Buyers and they won't even look at your offer unless the buyer attaches with their offer an acknowledgement that they received all that stuff. So you can do, you can give. There's nothing wrong with giving to them the stuff early. Get that three day right of rescission out of the way. Quick question: I had this happen to me a few months ago. Um, a normal deal, not a foreclosure or anything like that. The I represent buyer, other agent represents seller. I get the disclosures. Not one disclosure is dated. Uh, the AVID does not say who attended uh, and completed the AVID, what the date, time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, any of that. Is that I don't think it's a problem. Her question is, you're the buyer's agent. 
you get all these disclosures. For one thing, they're not dated. And the second thing is, on the AVID, it doesn't say who did the inspection. My reaction is, I don't care. I mean, dated, it better be true. This I don't care when you date it. It just better be true when you give it to me. Right? It doesn't matter when they date it. And I don't really care which agent did the AVID. The point is, the only thing the law requires is some agent at that company did an inspection. So that AVID is basically on behalf of that company. It doesn't really matter which particular agent did it. You know what a broker could do if they wanted to? Pick one of their agents and say, you're the one who does visual inspections on everything. I don't care who's listening it is. You are our designated visual inspector. Because remember, disclosures are on behalf of the brokerage. They're not on behalf of an individual. They're on behalf of the company. The company, someone in that company has to do a visual inspection. Right, right, right. Why do you care? So you're the listing agent? You're the listing agent and you know the buyer's agent never did a visual inspection. Why do you care? It's got nothing to do with you. It's their problem completely. Correct. 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 But to clarify slightly, the SSD is state mandated, and the SSD is also the first page of the SPQ. So the first page of the SPQ, if you look at it that way, is mandated. Or you could just do the SSD. The SPQ doesn't have to be done at all. I think it's it's very good to protect realtors. I recommend it. But the AVID? Yeah. Shh. And the question is, can, a, can an agent who's maybe out of the area hire someone else to do their visual inspection for them, right? Theoretically, I mean, all the, the point is, the, someone representing that other side, if they're represented at all, has a legal obligation to do a reasonably diligent visual inspection. Theoretically, I mean, if they hire someone else to do it, they're, they're the one who's still sending it or signing it. They're taking responsibility for it. I don't think there's any particular thing that that agent has to actually physically be the one who's doing it. I mean, it's interesting. You know what's really interesting to me is why do agents even have to do a visual inspection? I mean, buyers have eyes, don't they? <laughs> what are you going to see that they're not going to see? Agents. Unfortunately, what's the, the court's thinking is, here's the difference between you and the buyer. You, it's your business to look at houses. You've looked at a lot of houses. If you work long enough, you'll probably be, be in every house in Bakersfield, if you work long enough. Probably every house in Bakersfield will come on the market at one time in your life, and you'll probably go into it. So all that experience means you sort of know what to look for. Because you've looked at 50 million houses, and you say, I've seen a lot of houses, and most of them don't look like that over there. So you're going to point it out to the buyer, that's a red flag. Whereas the buyer has only looked at two houses in their life, they wouldn't necessarily know that that's not supposed to look like that. So you're not looking at the house with the eyes of a home inspector or a contractor. You're looking at a house with the eyes of someone who looks at a lot of houses. And you just sort of know what they're supposed to look like. Okay? Anyway, I'll take more questions. Let me just finish up what I was going to say, and then I'll take uh, as many questions as you want. Because um, I'm almost done. Um, so those are the changes to the big three. But I didn't mention, I mentioned two changes that happened to the RPA already this year, but there might be one change coming, might. You notice I use the word might? They still haven't finalized this. But if it happens, it's going to happen on December 14th. What is it going to be? It's going to be in the inspection paragraph where you can actually remove your inspection contingency right in that paragraph. You know how you get the contract has a bunch of contingencies, it actually has eight of them, and you remove them on the contingency removal form which lists all eight of them? 
But if you ever notice in the first paragraph, in paragraph three, the loan contingency, you can remove the loan contingency right in the loan paragraph. Well, now there's going to be a place to remove the inspection contingency right in the inspection paragraph. Why would you want to do that? Because you want to make your offer look good. You want to say to the seller, pick me rather than them because I've already removed my inspection contingency. I still think it's a dumb idea, which is why it's going to say right there, checkbox, buyer removes inspection contingency. That's going to say right under that, by checking this box, the buyer is acting against the advice of their realtor. And it's also going to say, you're an idiot, no, it's good. Um, uh, it's going to, that's what it means. But it's also going to say, although if you do remove your inspection contingency, you can still get inspections. What good that's going to do, I don't know. But the point is, okay. So like I said, they haven't done decided this for sure, but I think it's more likely than not that you're going to see that little thing in the inspection paragraph starting in December. Okay. Those are the changes to the big three. I also told you that the SSD is changing to the ESD. Are there any other forms that are going to change December 14th? Here's a little change. You know the generic addendum form? It says on that form, this is an addendum to the purchase contract or the lease or other. Or they're going to add another box and say, this is an addendum to a TDS. So if you want to in other words, you don't have to do a whole new TDS if you want to add something. You just easily use the addendum form. So that's good. Um, what else? What else? What else? I think that's all. Okay. Two more things I want to tell you real quickly. You know the request for repair form, the RR? Some people say it would be nice if there was something at the bottom where the seller could acknowledge that they actually got the stupid request for repair form. So I think they're going to put that in there. Um, and then on the... Um, Seller multiple counteroffer form. You know in the regular counteroffer form, you give the counteroffer to the buyer, they have three days to respond. But on a multiple counteroffer, if the seller responds and then the buyer responds, and then if the seller wants it, the seller has to re-sign it and send it back. On the current version of the form, that whole back and forth is only, they only got three days for it. Guess what? They're adding a fourth day. So now the process on the multiple counter of seller countering, buyer sending it back, and then the seller resending it back to make it official, you have a fourth day for that to happen instead of three. Okay? None of that is a big deal. There are, there are a few other little changes that I don't think are worth mentioning, so I won't. Those are the big changes coming on the forms December 14th. So I've told you all the new laws. I've told you the new forms. I told you that one case about the sharing of commissions between agents. Be careful about that. A couple other recent cases that have happened this year that I think are, are interesting. One of them basically said you, you never have to disclose prior appraisals unless it's FHA or VA. For example, buyer number one in the course of an escrow gets an appraisal. They give it to you, you know about it, but the deal falls apart. You put the house back on the market. Buyer number two comes along. Do you have to tell buyer number two about buyer number one's appraisal? The answer is no. It's not a report, it's not a fact, it's just an opinion. You don't have to disclose it, unless it's FHA or VA. Okay, so that was an interesting case. Here's another interesting case. You have a listing. Your seller fills out the TDS. Do you have any obligation as the listing agent to verify the truth of what your seller said? You're all hoping the answer is going to be no, right? You're, you're in luck. The court said... A listing agent does not have an obligation to verify. In other words, you don't have to be a private detective and go investigate every single thing the seller said to make sure your client's telling the truth. However, before you get too excited, other courts have said, listing agent, you do have an obligation to actually read what your seller wrote. And if your seller says something that's just simply obviously not true, it's no investigation is required. In other words, the seller says there's no HOA, and you know there is an HOA. You do have an obligation to tell your seller, don't you want to change that to say it actually has an HOA as opposed to it doesn't? 
What if the seller says, I don't care what you say, I'm going to leave it there, no HOA. Then you put in your remarks, my client's an idiot. <coughs> For some reason, they want to tell you that there's no HOA. I'm here to tell you there actually is. So it's not like you never have to correct your seller, but you don't have to do any investigation to verify things that you just are not obviously aware of. So now you're saying, as a buyer's agent, you recognize that what the seller said is not true. Yeah. Well, then you, as your fiduciary duty to your buyer, you're going to tell your buyer, I don't care what they said, that's not true. Yeah, to your buyer. I, some, when I get this asked question, people say, well, do I have to go back to the seller and make them change it? Why? You know it's wrong. You told your buyer it's wrong. Your buyer now knows the truth. You've satisfied the problem. You don't really have to go back and force the seller to redo their inaccurate disclosure. You've solved it. Okay? In your avid, or your, your put it in your avid, put it, put it, buyer's remarks, anywhere you want. What if, um, like in this area, there's a lot of realtor representing that themselves, but they have a partner, and they're like, well, you know, I didn't, I'm not going to babysit my, by my seller, but they're actually part of the transaction too. Like they have, you know, they're... So the realtor is... Is it on the buyer's side? On the, on the listing side. So, you know, like so there's a seller and there's an agent? Well, her and I are selling this property. Co I'm the agent and she's just the investor. But I have so she's the owner. Well, she's the owner, but I'm in the, the deal. You're also an owner, too. You're a part, the listing agent is a part owner of the property. Okay, so what about it, then? And, um, are they responsible to make sure that everything under this? Well, yeah. In other words, yeah, because you're not just the listing agent. You're also the owners. I'm use that as an excuse for my investor, even though they're part owners, too, because they're in it. That's not going to work. I mean, I mean, they're going to have a higher standard of truthfulness because they're actually an owner of the property, a part owner of the property. A couple more issues before I take more questions that, that come up sometimes, repeatedly, not just here, but they come up other places. One of them is... You know the, the four disclosure booklets? I like to say when you do disclosures, you have a checklist of five things. First, you're going to order the NHD. So you really have four things. The TDS, the SPQ, the lead paint, and the booklets. Okay. Now, what about the booklets? There are four of them, right? Environmental hazards, earthquake, lead paint, and home energy rating. How do I go about giving these to the buyer? Well, one choice is you can actually purchase the, f the hard copy. Do you guys still sell that, the hard copy four-in-one disclosure book? Does anyone even do that anymore? Anyway, there's a book. Maybe we don't even sell it anymore. Another possibility is under the, uh, there's a library on zip form called uh, Electronic Publications, where you can simply email the four booklets to the buyer's agent or the buyer. Another question people say is, well, does the seller even have to do that? Can they, can't they just email you a link to access the booklets? And that's okay, too. Well, the, well, then people say, doesn't the seller need to sign those booklets? And the answer is no, with one exception. And that is, if the house is pre-1960, one of the booklets, the earthquake booklet, has a signature page that must be filled out and signed. So in those cases, it's not good enough just to send a link because the seller has to actually fill out one page. You can do that electronically. You can do it on the zip form library. On the e-publication the e library on zip form, there's a copy of the four booklets, plus there's a copy of the signature page on the Homeowner's Guide to Earthquake Safety. So you never need a hard copy. And sending a link is okay. I mean, obviously, you want the buyer's agent to acknowledge that they got it. But just sending a link, I've always wondered about that myself. But, but the courts have, have seemed to say that that's OK just to send a link. Just keep in mind that one of the four booklets, the Homeowner's Guide to Earthquake Safety, definitely needs to be completed and signed by the seller if the house is pre-1960. library 
Yeah. Right. Right. But even the receipt, yes, you want a receipt. As a seller side, I'm entitled to a receipt. But am I entitled to a receipt of the actual booklet, or am I entitled to a receipt that you got the link? The courts seem to be saying the link is okay. So, you know, whether you like it or not, I can't say by law you have, you're entitled to receipt from the buyer that they physically received the booklet itself. Now, when I say courts have been okay with that, I've lower courts. We haven't had a decisive court of appeal case. Once again, any test case volunteers on this one, you know, feel free. But that's, that's the answer I have to give you on that one, okay? The other issue that comes up a lot is everywhere I go, um, brokerages come up with their own forms, right? The 5,000 forms on zip form is not enough. They want more, right? So they come up with their own addendum of some kind and they want you to sign it, right? They want you or your client to sign it. I put these into two categories. One of them is pure information. In other words, I think that the CAR SPQ is not sufficient, the SBSA is not sufficient. There's more information I want you to know. Here's the list of the information I want you to have, and they give it to you're the listing and they give it to the buyer's agent. Please give this to your buyer. I don't think you can you can avoid giving that to your buyer. I mean, if the if the seller wants you to know something, you're gonna well, they want you to know this here. And, they, and they're entitled to an acknowledgement that you gave it to them. You could say as a buyer's agent, I think this is a stupid form. I'm not going to give it to my client. I don't know, why would you do that? You know, maybe you may think it's a stupid form, but just give it to your buyer. Says, here's a stupid form the seller wants you to read. You know, so, but you, know, you still don't hide it from them. But there's a different category of form where it's not really a disclosure. It's like an addendum where they actually want your buyer to sign and, and indemnify the listing broker for this or this or this. And for that, I just simply say, no, I'm not signing that. We're not going to uh, do your job. If you do, if you do your job right, there's no problem. We're not going to sign this extra indemnification against you, holding you harmless for everything under the sun. See, that's not a disclosure form. That's an addendum to the contract that they're trying to get you to sign. And if I was a buyer's agent, I'd say, no, my buyer's not going to sign that. But if you just have some information you want my buyer to read, sure, I'll give it to him. Nothing wrong with more information. Now, do you have to verify that the information on that form is accurate? No, you're just passing it on from the seller to them, to the buyer. Okay? Yeah, but they're asking the buyer. I'd have to look at it. And if I were the buyer's agent, I would look at it and say, Are they asked, is my buyer giving up any of their rights here or something? If so, I'm probably going to say, I don't think you should need to sign that. Why do you, why do you need to? Why? They're trying to make you give up rights. Why should you have to give up rights? You know, what are you getting for this? You can give it to them but not sign it. You can always give it to them and not sign it, right? Say, here's something they want you to sign. Take a look at it. Just don't sign it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like I said, if it's pure information and you're not giving up any rights, it's not really an addendum. It's just, it's like an attachment to the TDS and you're saying, here's more stuff I want you to know. Say, fine, tell me, tell me more, you know? Then I don't mind you having them sign it, just acknowledging the receipt. So there's one thing to assign to acknowledge receipt, the other thing to sign to actually agree to something. Difference between a disclosure and an addendum. Pardon? You can always do that. Of course, that, that means you're, you're amending the ad amendment, which means it's got to go back to the seller to see if they agree to the things you changed. And of course, once you start crossing off things on a form, you're supposed to date and initial everything you just changed. But if you want to go to all that trouble, that's fine too. Sometimes I feel that REOs uh, do this a lot. They do it, and it's like you either agree or you don't get the house. And that's true. REOs are notorious. They tend to be a lot of times out of state, not familiar with California law. They do the same thing in every state where they sell. And if you don't sign their things, they won't sell you the house. Well, then you have a choice to make. If, it's a, if the seller says, unless you sign my addendum, we will not sell you the house, then, I mean, it, that's another good point. There are two types of addendum. There's the addendum that they give you up front saying this is part of the contract, or the addendum that they give you halfway through the deal. Those you can ignore. So we've already got a contract. 
I choose not to sign your addendum. But if they give the addendum as part of the original offer or counter offer, they're saying, this is part of the deal. You want the deal, you need to sign this. And then you have to, and then you have to decide in that case whether you want to sign it or not. Isn't real estate complicated? Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, federal law and RESPA requires a very specific disclosures by a broker when in the transaction there are affiliates that have that the brokerage has some type of ownership interest. <clears throat> you can call the hotline, we'll give you the, the exact language you have to use as part of you can just make up your own language. There's very specific language you have to provide to the other side about your affiliation with other entities involved in the transaction. That's federal law. What if you uh, receive a disclosure that has no bearing at all on the property? And you, can you just say this doesn't... Remember what I said? Buyer's agent can say this is a stupid disclosure. I'm not going to give it to my buyer. That's your judgment. You have every right to do that. And by so doing, it eliminates the need for some of the other documents, like, like the carbon monoxide and that, which you might get from another agent. And the other agent will say you just did a stack of, of documents, but you've already got it listed in your advisory. Can you say just refer to the advisor? I'm not filling out all the things. Okay, so you're saying you are the which side? You're the listing side. And the buyer's side is trying to get you to... to They're trying to send me a bunch more of their disclosures. So the buyer is giving the seller disclosures? So the the buyer is, is the buyer asking the seller for information? Not necessarily. They just want to make sure that they've signed, for example, let's say carbon monoxide, uh, Megan's law, and those things. So those are all listed on our current advisory for the company I work for. Those are all listed as links on the current. Advisory. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand that because first of all, the um, first of all, the carbon monoxide detector is not required. It's on zip form. If the buyer wants it, get it. Get the, have their own agent give it to them. Why, is it, why involve the listing agent? They want to have the seller sign it. I don't know what the purpose of signing it is. You don't have, there's no reason for the seller to sign it because all that form does is sort of talk about carbon monoxide detectors. It doesn't really commit the seller to anything. What was the other one you said? Besides, uh, well, they have, like, on, ours, on, on our advisory, it has like, the Megan's Law. Oh, Megan's Law. And that, of course, is on the purchase contract now. You don't need that form. In other words, I think what you're really saying is some, some people are telling you they want you to acknowledge that these forms duplicate these things. I mean, it's, you can do it. I mean, it's, I'd have to answer these individually, but if you're the listing side and the buyer side wants you to sign things, uh, the listing side, do what you're required to do by law or in addition to what your broker wants you to do. And it doesn't really matter what the buyer, but if the buyer asks you for something as part of their offer and says, part of my offer is you will give me this, Because their broker said, if you don't get these, you're not getting paid. So the agent says, I better do this. That's not my problem. That's your, that's your problem. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they're totally confused. Buyer's agent, you never are entitled to the agency between the listing agent and the seller. And I know why you're confused, because the law is so stupid. And the law does require the buyer's agent to give an agency to the seller. So since that's so stupid, some people take it further and says, well, I guess that I'm entitled to a copy of the one that the listing agent gave to the seller, which you're not. It's a dumb law anyway. They're just, you're just not entitled to it. I don't see why you, why you would, would want it anyway. Uh, what does the law say if there's been a death in the property? Um, do you know rentals are just like sales for that? If there was a death on the property within the last three years, you have to disclose it on a rental just like a sale. But there's a three year cutoff. Yeah. Do you mean the, what do you mean specifically? 
Oh, you're covered. You didn't hear the good news? It was extended just for California. Yes. Yeah, her question is, you know, on the, on the idea of a um, debt forgiveness on a short sale, in other words, do you have to pay tax on that? And there was a federal law and there was a state law and they both expired. So in other words, does that mean, you know, if I owe the bank 300 and the house is worth 270, I do a short sale, they forgive 30,000, do I have to pay income tax on that 30? In every other state you do. Not in California, because we got the, this is why you pay your, your dues to CAR, we went to the IRS and says, it doesn't make sense in California that you'd have to pay tax, because California has these anti-deficiency laws, which means when a lender forecloses on you, all they get is the house. They can't sue you for the difference. So on a short sale, the lender isn't really forgiving a debt, because they never could have collected that debt if they foreclosed. So the IRS... So, in other words, the IRS bought it. I mean, I mean, they agreed with, it, with, with that analysis. And um, they put it in writing that in California, going for forever, you don't have to pay income tax on debt forgiveness on a short sale on residential one to four owner-occupied. I'll get to your question in a second. Refinances are still okay. Um, but... As long as the original loan was owner-occupied, it doesn't have to be an owner-occupied property anymore. It can be a refi. If the original loan was an owner-occupied primary buyer, primary residence purchase, if you do a short sale on that loan ever, you're okay in California. If it was originally, if the loan was originally a primary residence, it doesn't matter that it's a rental now. If you refied, you're good. If you refied and took money out, you're not completely good anymore. You may have some tax. Now, you said loan modification. It doesn't apply to loan modification. Just short sales. That you're right. It, it would have been nice if the law had gotten, had gotten extended because that would have even covered loan mods, but it doesn't. So what I just told you about is just covering debt forgiveness on short sales. But at least we have that another reason to live in California. There is a cap, but it's, I forget what it is, but it's pretty high. Call the hotline and give me the exact number, okay? Way back? Same thing. In other words, you, you don't, yeah, right. That's not covered, so you may still have a tax consequence, unless you're in bankruptcy or insolvency. State followed along. Once we convince the IRS, we convince the FTB also. Pretty cool. I have an escrow where the, uh, I have the seller, the buyer's agent has returned all of the money that I paid for the NHD. Right. It's been two weeks, and I keep saying it's, he doesn't have time to have the buyer sign the NHD. Well, that buyer's agent just acknowledged that he got it, right? Um, so you're good. Now, if he's going to de deny these conversations he's had with you, said, I never told you I got it. You know what I mean? Email. You got it. <laughs> you don't need a buyer's signature. The point is, the three days started when the agent got it. You don't need the buyer's signature. I mean, the contract says buyer will sign it. The buyer's supposed to sign it, but the fact that they don't sign it doesn't really change anything. Uh, back to the TDS addendum. Does the seller... Fill that. Now, let's say you, you sign a carpet halfway through the yeah. listing. Then the seller fills off that addendum. Yeah. Not you. Right. Right. The seller signs it anyway, yes. So it's a, it's a, it's the addendum a, to, the, to, to a TDS would be, but maybe it's the agent who's making the, maybe the agent is saying, I forgot to tell you something. It's not my seller. It's got nothing to do with my seller. I, the listing agent, forgot to tell you something. Then in that case, it would be the agent so signing it. So in other words, because both the seller and the listing agent sign the TDS. So either one of them can amend their portion of the TDS. You close on a property, and now, you're, now your seller, your, your buyer now owns this property. You get there, and you find out that someone forgot to mention a detail, but some people that moved into the property, but now you have people there. You don't know who they are. They're squatters or they're tenants? Or? No, we don't know. They won't tell us who they are. We don't know. They're saying that they're, they're, someone, the neighbor says that they were the prior owners that they moved back into the property, so we don't know how to get them out of there. 
Well, you can try the police, but they'll probably say, oh, we're not going to get involved. So you got to almost treat them as tenants. Yeah. Yeah, there's a process, you know, John Doe, one through three. Or the police, unfortunately, unless we're trying to get this whole thing with this pilot program of police being able to get rid of squatters without evicting them, there's a pilot program in three cities. Hopefully it'll be expanded beyond that. But in the meantime, it's what you've got to deal with. I've lost part of my audience. But anyway, yes. We're almost done. On the, on the TDS, I check C, Agent Visual yeah, Abbott. Right. And I don't write anything else on there. Right. Okay. By the way, when on the TDS, if you check C attached Avid, that means the Avid is part of the TDS, which means the TDS is not complete until the Avid is supplied. Right. So, and I've seen that happen where the agents don't give you the Avid till a week before closing. That's when the TDS became final. That's when the three day right of rescission began. Of our last meetings we had, they recommended not putting that on the TDS, checking that, because then the lender could request a copy of it. Her comment is, I don't know if any of you are running into this, that when the lender sees the C-attached Avid, the lender wants to see it. Yep. Does that cause problems? Do lenders look at it and say, oh, I don't want that? They don't look at it. I mean, it's up to you. I mean, I, if that's a, if, if that's an issue, but I mean, you got to disclose what you got to disclose. If you don't put it on the AVID, you got to put it on the TDS. I mean, you can't hide things. So I don't know why the AVID would be more interesting to the lender than what you write on the TDS. Either way, you have to disclose what you have to disclose. But if, you, if you're if you saying as a practical reason, for some reason, the AVID causes more problems, don't do the AVID, but you still have to disclose in writing what you have to disclose. So I have a recent event where the appraiser, we know nothing on this contract says anything about a termite. Yeah. And the underwriter says, well, I think we need a clearance. The, the right. appraiser recommended to the underwriter that. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry if that happens, but I mean, anyone, lenders can do whatever they want. So the buyer signed a waiver. Okay. And the lender was okay with that? Yeah. That's true. The lenders don't require a termite clearance, do they? Sometimes they do, right? Sometimes the sees a bunch of stuff wrong. There's no law that you have a termite clearance, but if the uh, particular lender in a particular case says, I want a termite clearance, you need a termite clearance. Or maybe the buyer says, I don't care what the lender says, I want a termite clearance. It's up to everybody, okay? Looks like I'm home. Oh, there we go. <laughs> the question is, where is it the hardest place to get a license? I have no idea. I'm sure it's harder in California than anywhere else. A lot of people say it's too easy to get a license in California, but the laws are more complicated in California. I assume it's hard. I don't know. I don't know. No idea. Are you thinking of moving? <laughs> yes, you are, aren't you? Yeah, she is. She's thinking of moving. Every time I talk about all this stuff, people say, why am I in this business? You know, why am I in California in this business? I don't know, and I'm sorry. I'm, like I keep saying, I'm not the ZipForm DocuSign digital inks expert. So, sorry. Really... Don't really know. Okay, everybody. Happy holidays. See you next year.